Welcome to Fear Street. <laughs> I was first abducted in 1987. I was 12 years old. I say abducted, but it's not like that. Actually, you go willingly. It's scary, but it's exciting too. And they're somehow able to make you feel okay about things. It's not until later that you feel bad or like you've been violated. And they don't do a lot of probing, like raping or anything like that. That's Hollywood nonsense. They look inside of people sometimes, but they have machines that do it. Not really machines, but it's like a room where things get done and the walls are... It's hard to explain, so just imagine that all the walls are kind of like x-ray machines. That's the easiest way to describe it. Sometimes there would be others there and they'd be looking into them or they'd put them under and cut them open, but not usually. They took tissue samples from all of us, I think, and they never put you under or give you any anesthetic or anything. They just poke you with like those things they take samples of the ocean floor with. Like that, but really small. They pull out chunks of you. It's usually done on the butt or on the lower back. Mostly, they talked with me. Just questions. And they'd show me things like television shows and things. And they'd ask me questions about them. I think the walls measure our reaction to things too, same as they take x-rays. I don't know that, but it's the feeling I got. They never let you ask questions about what they're doing. Even once I got friendly with a few of them, they just don't like it when you ask them questions. They hate it. You can't understand their language, it just sounds like, hmm. I'm positive that we'll never be able to communicate with them in their language. I should mention that these are the greys that you hear about, except they aren't grey. They're sort of beige and it's clothes anyway. They aren't naked. I don't know if there are others. People say there are, but I've only ever met these. Anyway, you can't understand them, but they can understand you and they can put thoughts into your head but they can't hear your thoughts you have to speak to them they can't hear you very well or they're not good at understanding English so you have to speak loudly and slowly I don't know if they understand other languages but I'm pretty sure they would they're interested in all of us in everything that goes on. They like a lot of things about our culture too. They like some of our music. Bluegrass is their favorite so far as I've seen. They like it a lot. They love that African instrument that looks like a gourd with 13 strings. Love it. But they can't stand horns or horn music. They hate classical music and jazz. I think trumpets sort of sound like their language. It's a feeling that I get, but I've never been able to ask them. They've taken me up just about every two years, I'd say, since 1987, just about. Sometimes it's more often, and I didn't go up at all between 1995 and 2000. They usually keep me for what feels like a day, then turns out to be about four hours, usually. The longest I stayed with them was three weeks. During that time, they made me make phone calls and keep up appearances. They aren't really bad, well I was gonna say people, but they're not really bad people or whatever. 
The two that I got sort of close with told me to call them Jack and Gina. I don't know if they're male or female or even if they have different sexes. But I know those aren't their real names. Those are just names that they told me. They will make contact with Earth on a wide scale in 2021. That's the year when they'll land here, or colonize, or whatever. I'm not exactly sure what their plan is. They don't seem to be evil or dangerous. Their planet is, so they told me anyway, a very long way away. They couldn't explain to me how far they said because it was too far for me to understand and it was also close to the side. I have no idea what that meant but it's always stuck with me. Home is too far for you to understand but also close to the side. We don't have anything that they want so they told me. So I don't really know why they come here or why they've taken so many of us up or why they've gotten to be friends with me. They don't have any religion and they don't need oxygen or water or trees or anything, I don't think. They don't eat people. I don't think they want to breed with us or genetically engineer us. I don't know what they want. But they've been coming here for, I guess, at least 10 or 20,000 years. I'm not very good about history and Upper Paleolithic and all that. But they've got video of all sorts of stuff and they showed me video of Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon. Which really were just like us humans except they all had black skin, way less diversity and all sorts of other human-like things. Also, they showed me video of the pyramids being built and this huge stone building that I guess is lost somewhere or was destroyed, but it was in Europe, I could tell from the video. They have video of them talking with all sorts of people all throughout the history of Earth. They showed me some of them and asked me questions about them, but I couldn't understand any of it because I only speak English, and even English from two or three hundred years ago is so different that I could hardly understand it. So I told them that they probably knew more about it than I did. I was up three weeks ago. That was the last time. I'm pretty sure I'll go up again in a couple of years, but I'm not sure after that. The whole program, or whatever they call it, is going to change in July 2021. I think they said 8th, but it could have also been 18th. I wasn't hearing very well. They weren't trying to intimidate me or even to warn me, so I don't think we have anything to worry about. I hope they don't show the videos they took of me when they first started taking me up because... I was so scared and young, and they're embarrassing. What I'm about to tell you isn't about me ever seeing a UFO, but what my grandfather swears to be true, and what he experienced back in the day. This event was also told back to me the same by other older folk in the same generation as my grandfather. They all swear it to be true, and I also can't come up with a reason why they'd all lie. Keep in mind, my grandfather and the other old folks said that this happened sometime between 1935 and 1945. The reason they're not sure is because they never really paid attention to calendar dates. Mind you, they lived in villages in northern Iraq. So technology wasn't up to speed at their time and in their location. Here's some backstory. During the summers in northern Iraq, all the men in the villages ever did was work on their farmlands, build homes, more farms, 
and mainly bring food to their family's table. Women did all of the chores, cooking at home, making sure to prep their children for school, and having everything packed up and ready for the husband to take to work. When winter hit, nobody was farming, working, or doing anything outside since the villages were a little more elevated on the mountains. So obviously the snow and cold prevented them from doing the majority of work outside and most of the villages would just stay in and live off what they had gathered in the summer. Also, the winter was an ideal time to get married and everyone got married in the winter. And so what my grandfather told me starts here. My grandfather was at the reception building and was pretty much enjoying the wedding dinner there. The singer supposedly was taking way too long to come back from relieving himself of what seemed to be number two. Mind you, in 1930s northern Iraq, they didn't have the toiletries that we have today. To take a dump, you had to go outside, hike a five minute walk towards the waste areas, dig a hole, squat, and plop. Then you had to bury your poop and walk back to wherever you were. So the singer was gone for about an hour or more and all of the guests were curious and some worried. My grandfather goes outside and finds snow footholds going in one direction. All of the other tracks that he saw were supposedly bi-directional showing that they had the person trekking to and from wherever they were going. So eventually, he finds the footholds stop, and no other tracks were around where he was standing. No squat prints, no waste holes, nothing. He goes back to the wedding, and about half an hour later, the singer walks through the entrance. The groom was pissed and started yelling and asking where the hell he had been. Some women were crying in hysteria, thinking he might have slipped and broke something. Everyone is curious and my grandfather notices that he was a little pale. The singer warmed up a bit and told what he witnessed. This is what he said with slight adjustments due to the language translation. As I said to the other entertainers, I was going to relieve myself outside. I was walking to find a spot when I was suddenly approached from behind by two figures. They asked me, do you want to go somewhere far? I said, what do you mean by far? The two figures said, how about China? They had this floating vehicle above them, hover closer to the ground. They took me by the arm and I walked into it. We suddenly flew very high and very fast. Eventually we got there and I walked down and wandered the countryside for a little bit. I went back to the two figures and said that I wanted to go back. So we did and they dropped me off and flew away really fast. I walked back and now I'm here. Some people thought the singer had drank too much and was talking crazy. Everyone was relieved that he was safe and back to the party, but pretty much everyone called his recollection BS. But the weird part was when the singer revealed to the guests that he had a bunch of flowers. Everyone was in shock because there's no way in hell those flowers could have come from northern Iraq during winter. It was all snow, and this plant couldn't have grown anywhere near up the mountains in that harsh weather. Whether or not you want to believe it is up to you, but my grandfather and other older guys swear it to be true. All of them saw the flowers, and they weren't fake or anything. They were real. Back when I was an undergrad, I had a couple of buddies who were big stargazers. One of them lived in a remote part of eastern Washington, 
where he could see everything clearly away from the light pollution. He invited me and another friend to visit his family for Thanksgiving one year and we said yes. One night, we went out into a field of knee-high grass and were looking up at the sky. It was really neat and we saw a bunch of shooting stars. My friend suddenly pointed to a bright light in the sky and asked what it was. My other friend, the one interested in astronomy, didn't know. It looked kind of like a planet, but evidently there shouldn't have been any visible planets that night. It didn't really move, but it bobbed in the sky, kind of bouncing up and down. Then, like a candle or something, it fizzled out. It literally looked like it had burned up. That would have been weird by itself, but actually, that wasn't the weirdest part. We sort of thought nothing of it, and were actually joking about seeing a UFO, when we came across a guy, in the middle of a field. I still have no idea how he got there, since we could see pretty far in all directions, and would have noticed him walking around. He was young, pretty much our age. He wasn't wearing any shoes or a shirt, and as far as I could tell, was only wearing jeans. He was sitting curled up, with his arms wrapped around his knees, and shivering. Keep in mind, it was the end of November, so no one would ever go out without a shirt, much less a jacket. We were scared to approach him, so we asked from afar if he was okay. He sort of stared at us blankly and said he was fine. He didn't sound drunk, but you could hear in his voice that he was cold. Eventually, we went over to him and asked how he got there. He said he didn't want to talk about it and that he needed to go to the hospital. So my friend called 911 and some cops showed up with an ambulance at a nearby gas station we all walked to. I let him borrow my coat while we waited. He didn't really say anything except he asked for our names and what we were doing. He also asked my friend about a couple constellations. The cops asked us a few questions and the paramedics took the guy away. I let him keep my jacket. My friend told this story to his family the next morning and I remember I had forgotten all about the light. He made that connection though. His family thought it was spooky but figured we'd just had a run in with a junkie. One night, about seven years ago, I remember going outside of my house because I could see an amazing light show through the window. It looked like red, white, and blue LED lights, like the ones you get at Chuck E. Cheese, but extremely bright and lighting up my entire house. As I go outside, I see a huge saucer-shaped craft spinning incredibly fast, but somehow I was the only one outside that night witnessing this incredible sight. I had somehow lost all my senses except my vision because I couldn't hear, feel, or smell anything in those moments, as I was sure it was a freezing winter night, and living on a dirt road, I was used to the smell of dust in the air. Anyways, it was spinning so fast that it was somehow liquefying, but remaining perfectly intact in a saucer-like shape. I then saw a white flash of light and was somehow transported to my high school, Ramada. I was living in Mexico at the time and going to school in Arizona, so there's no way that I was sleepwalking there. 
I was laid out on one of the many dozen tables that were located there underneath a huge metal roof that stands on top of it. I couldn't move and I was bare chested and was having difficulty breathing. I still couldn't smell, hear, or feel anything. Next to the tables is the soccer and football field and there in the middle of the field I could see the craft had stopped spinning and was somehow grounded and not making any movements or emitting any lights anymore. Immediately after that, I was surrounded by, I kid you not, what everyone recognizes as gray aliens. They were so tall and horrifying, I tried and tried to scream, but nothing would come out. I was paralyzed with fear, but I could sense my screams inside my chest. I've never been so scared in my life. All I recall is them surrounding me and just staring into my eyes with those unblinking coal black eyes of theirs. They all had different colored uniforms that were made out of some crazy reflective material that I've never seen before. That's all I remember about that night. I then closed my eyes and found myself standing in the exact place where I first witnessed the red, white, and blue lights. I began to cry and just went to sleep and never told a soul about that night. I'm male. I live in Latvia. My father is a hunter and occasionally we go hunting during the weekends. Prior to the opening of the hunting season in autumn, we go hunting alone. So one of these times, we're about to end the hunt because the night's been generally uneventful. It's a couple of minutes after midnight, but I can't wait for the call from my father, who usually tells me to gather my stuff for getting in the car. This includes unloading the rifle, putting it in the case, and folding the chair and the tripod. Logically, I became bored. My father was 100 to 200 meters from me, and there wasn't exactly anything to do in the middle of a wheat field, so I started looking around and ended up stargazing. The night was pretty clear, and I could see the stars quite well. The clouds themselves seemed to be pretty low and not very dense. Then I noticed something that initially looks like a star pulsating in the sky. When I have a closer look, I notice that the light isn't just pulsating, it's blinking. So an aircraft, I think to myself. This seems to be true because the light's moving in a fairly linear flight path across the sky slightly faster than the speed at which commercial airliners appear to be flying when approaching an airport. So I assume that it's some sort of aircraft that's just flying low. The interesting part is, I hear nothing. Because it appears to fly fast, I assume that I should be able to hear it, but I can't hear anything. Even after listening, for a couple of seconds. This sparks up my interest about the aircraft even more. So I pull up my rifle to look at it through the scope. The object is pretty small from what I can gather and is indeed an aircraft of some sort because I can almost make out the hole. It appears to emit red pulsating light all the time and has green strobes. Also, it appears to fly either towards or away from me, or hover for short periods of time. That's when I got an idea I thought was clever at the time. I have a green laser on my rifle, 
which I can use for getting a better look at hogs without startling them. So I adjusted it a bit, so the beam was narrower and maintained further, then shine it at the clouds. Nothing. So if I can illuminate the flying object, then I'll have a rough estimate about its height. Then I shine the laser at the object. That's when things got really weird. I couldn't illuminate it, so I'm guessing it must have been further away. But then I noticed something. It started turning. And after a couple of seconds, it was flying towards me at its previous speed. Now at this point, I was freaking out. And although it was getting much closer, I still couldn't hear a thing. I crouched down to the ground on my knee and tried to support the rifle better because my hands were shaking wildly by now. Then it flew right over my head. The laser which I was still shining at it illuminated its hole. So I'm certain that it was flying lower than the clouds. Although saying that I was scared would be an understatement, I managed to get a good look at it. It had two green strobe lights, one at the tail section and one at the wingtip, and multiple round, pulsating red lights on the bottom, and one more below each wing. It looked a bit like an A-10, although I didn't see much at the tail section, as if there were no control surfaces there at all. Despite this, the actual hull was still unclear, possibly because the lights were too bright in comparison. There were no windows to speak of, at least nothing illuminated from the inside. Although I took my gun off safety when it was right overhead and my finger found its way dangerously close to the trigger, I quickly realized just how stupid the idea I had would be. It crossed over my head in about six seconds, yet I still can't get over the fact that I didn't hear a thing during this. Interestingly enough, it didn't disappear like you often hear in stories about UFOs. Although it was flying away, I could see it banking slightly to the sides and doing gentle curves. I took out my smartphone and tried to take videos of it with and without the laser and both plainly and through the scope, but all I got was darkness and a slight streak of light for a second or two in one of the videos. Apart from being terrified so much, I was also mesmerized. I had never seen such an aircraft. After 10 more minutes, my father called and all he had to say in the car was that he was disappointed that I was wasting the batteries of the laser by shining it around so much. He didn't think of actually looking into the skies to find out what I was shining it at. I'm not sure I'll ever know what I saw in that night, but it was definitely something not of this world. I was living out in the country with my girlfriend's family when I was 19 in Eastern Canada. She went out with her friends one night and I was alone in the house with her mom since her father worked nights. I was upstairs reading a book when the dog, who was tied up outside, started going absolutely nuts. I figured there may have been another dog on the property and maybe they were fighting, so I ran downstairs and threw on my boots to get out there and break it up. When I flung open the door, I got goosebumps immediately. What seemed like every dog for miles around was barking, yelping, and howling. I barely had time to think about what the hell was going on when I saw an object floating above the tree line, which was probably about a half a mile to a mile away. I can only describe it as a disco ball because that's exactly what it looked like. It was round and about the size of a pencil eraser from that distance. It would float to the left and to the right and slightly up and down. It would do this for maybe 
10 seconds and then it disappeared. It would reappear a second later in a different spot. It did this probably six times. Enough that when it disappeared, I would start scanning the tree line to see where it would reappear next. It was completely silent. I ducked my head in the door at one point and saw that my girlfriend's mother was asleep on the couch. I think I even called her name once, but she didn't wake up. I didn't want to go inside and get her for fear of missing it. The last time the thing disappeared, in the exact spot that it blinked out, a teardrop-shaped light from the top of the sky shot straight down and behind the tree line extremely fast. I stood there for a second, trying to figure out if I'd actually seen this or maybe I was hallucinating. And almost on cue, as if to give me proof that I had seen it, I heard voices and looked to the road and saw that a couple had stopped their car and had been standing on the road watching the very same thing I'd been seeing. I couldn't hear actual words, but there was clearly surprise in their voices. I thought about going down on the road to talk to them, but it was quite a ways off and I was in my pajamas. Before I really had a chance, they drove away. That's about it. Maybe not the coolest UFO story ever, but the dogs and the people make it stand out as a truly odd experience for me because I know it wasn't something I imagined and I assume it wasn't a normal aircraft because I don't think dogs generally get riled up over planes or helicopters. This happened in the early evening in late August or early September about two years ago. It was still bright out, but the sun had either just set or was about to set. My girlfriend and I live in a midwestern city of about 150,000 people, so it's anything but rural. We were on our way home, driving along a main street, heading west, when I saw a collection of about three or four yellow-white lights in a mostly vertical alignment just above the tree line, directly ahead of us. I didn't think anything of the lights at first. I just assumed it was one of the tall radio towers we have scattered throughout the city. However, as I watched the lights, I noticed that their formation began to change as they started to float away from one another. Immediately I knew that I wasn't seeing a radio tower and I pointed it out to my girlfriend. As we continued toward the lights, I had my girlfriend who was driving pull into a parking lot south of the road we were on so we could observe them without being distracted. Further south of us by about a quarter of a mile was a major highway. The lights began to demonstrate similar behavior. They would rise from over the tree line to the north of our position, float south until they were over the major highway, and then disappear. There were about 8 to 12 lights in total, but only 4 of them in the sky at the same time. I suppose it's important to note that after the lights went out, there was no trace of them. There was no silhouette of debris falling. No explosions, no smoke, nothing. They just vanished. My girlfriend tried to take a picture of them, but she was using her cell phone and they didn't come out very well. After the lights stopped coming, we drove home the rest of the way with our eyes in the sky. We passed by someone else who had parked along the side of the road and had his head out the window looking up for more lights as well. When I got home I tried to look online to see if there was any sort of celebration going on at that time in my city, thinking it might be Chinese lanterns or something similar, but nothing came up and nothing was reported on the news. UFOs? Definitely. Extraterrestrial? 
I'm not sure.